So this week is the first week of fiscal management. We're going to talk about it for two weeks. Um, in the past, I've done uh, for my 150, I did it in just one week, and it's a lot of information to cover. Um, there's a lot of variables, and there's a lot of diversity in our field that I'll talk about, um, and that impacts how we fiscally manage our programs. But for today, some of the things I'm going to talk about will be types of funding, types of budgeting, benefits, salaries, and matrices. So, like I said before, this is really specific to your program and to your goals. So we have huge diversity within our field. State and federally funded, then there's private prop programs, there's church run programs, there's FCC, family child care, um, then there's nonprofits, um, and then there's corporate as well. So within all of those programs, depending on which the which of the programs you're a director in, a site supervisor in, or a program director in, that's going to impact how much you handle and manage money. So for many of you, your next goal is you already are a site supervisor or you would like to be a site supervisor. Sometimes site supervisors don't directly handle money. Um, and so this might seem like it's not very interesting to you, but I think that it should be because even if you don't directly handle money on a daily basis, you still really need to be aware of financial management. If you are mismanaging your money, that will have direct implications on every part of your program and more often than not on the goals that you have for your program. So even if you have an accounting department that spends all of this time doing payroll and managing money and tells you about the budget, if you're not handling the money that you're receiving well, that's going to impact the goals that you're gonna be able to do. Because most of the goals that we wanna implement in our program are going to need some kind of financial funds in order to make it happen. Even if it's just something like curriculum, buying books, buying supplies, things like that, in order to make a curriculum shift, that can be quite expensive. Then you have things like capital improvements, which are roofs that are you know, $30,000, um, new flooring, which could be $20,000, you know, and things like that, especially if we have older programs, those things require a lot of money. So a site supervisor should be aware of the budget, they should be aware of the budget that they have, um, and then what they need to do in order to make sure that the dreams that they have for their center will have the funds available. And then for some of you, you are small business owners. Um, and so this has more of a direct implication on you and that you are the person that keeps the light on. And at the end of the day, it's your butt on the line when it comes to salaries and things like that. Um, I have never been a small business owner, um, but I have been a site supervisor within programs. Um, and I've been given a lot of money um, to handle over the years. Um, and I can think back to ways when I've done it well and ways when I haven't done it well, and I'll talk more about that. But what I'm gonna talk about budget in the easiest, most simplest terms. Some of you are already budgeting for your programs, um, and so this might seem like things that you, that you already know, um, but maybe I can remind you of ways that we need to budget. But the reason that we have a budget is you need to kind of have a forecast for the future. Um, programs that don't do well are ones that roll by the seat of their pants. They don't know what's coming and they don't know what's going out. So forecasting for the future is how much money do I have? When will I have that money? When are things due? And then planning for the future. What goals do I have and how much will that cost? Um, I remember I had allotted amounts of money um, as a state supervisor that I had, and I wanted to use some of that money in order to replenish some of our books and our curriculum when I was a state supervisor within a much larger nonprofit that had an accounting department. Well, we had to spend out on a lot of cleaning that year. We had um, a, some kids with lice and some kids with scabies, um, and so we had to have carpets cleaned, um, and then we had other things because we were renting a room within a larger organization, and that's where I was a state supervisor. So then we also had to spend out with some capital improvements um, to be able to kind of keep our lease of that room and that bathroom and things like that. So we had to replace some flooring and things like that. So it ended up at the end of the year that I didn't have this money that I had planned on originally for my future goals, and it had to roll over into another year. So that's, reason, that's another reason to know about things that are happening and you have what's called contingency funds, uh, contingency, which is kind of like worst case scenario, you typically have like 10 to 15% of your income that is stowed away for like rainy day 
terrible, lost a lot of tuition, lost a lot of income, things like that. When something really goes wrong, where can you draw from other funds in order to support some of the things that you had? And then other times, like with my, my previous antidote, I, I had to spend in other areas. I had to draw from that money and I couldn't that, then that year spend it on curriculum um, changes um, and books that I wanted to, but I was able to another year. And then it's always a good idea to keep track of what you actually make and what you actually spend. So if you have an accounting department, that's what they're doing all day. Um, if you are a small business owner, you need to be doing that with probably some kind of like Quicken or having an accountant or a bookkeeper or something like that, because you need to know how much you're actually making in tuition and the way you're actually spending on salary. So what is the process of budgeting? Um, so what I'm talking about is um, creating an annual budget and then keep um, creating kind of a monthly budget as you need to. And this is the way that we'll monitor expenses throughout the year and make adjustments as needed. So in this box over here, I have a picture, um, and this is not from childcare, but I like how they actually show it. So they actually have um, the actual, and then they have the budget, and then they have the difference. So what did we think that we were gonna spend on something? What did we actually spend? And what was the difference between what we forecasted and what we actually brought in? That's gonna allow us to make adjustments. Like I had said previously, we spent out in capital and in cleaning one year. Um, and so we had to make adjustment, adjustments in another part of my, uh, budget, which was the curriculum and lessons. So you're really using your budget as a planning tool. It's tracking your actual expenses and then comparing it to your monthly, your monthly budget. It's good to make monthly adjust, adjustments because each month is going to probably have different incomes and different expenses. So um, my example for this is like in July, you have four large families, like maybe they each had four kids that were in your center. If both of those centers left, that would impact all of your classrooms and all of your tuition that you would be drawing from that month. So you're going to compare that month to what you actually forecasted and make make the adjustments. So you had no way of knowing in January that both of these families would be moving. Um, and so that would take a hit to the income that you bring in through tuition. So then you're going to make, need to make adjustments to your annual budget and your monthly budget in order to make up for that. Like, for example, maybe you can't have subs. You as the director or the assistant director will have to be subs um, because you're going to need to save that $3,000, $4,000 that you've just lost. So then what does a monthly budget look like? And this is an example um, from your textbook. Um, they call it like rainbow childcare um, and they actually look at income. So where are you actually getting your income? This is a smaller thing. Um, so you're only getting $2,000 a month from actual parent tuition. Um, then you're getting $4,000. Um, so twice as much from subsidized childcare fee, like state funded or federally funded programs. So you're bringing in $6,000. But you need to pay almost half of that in your salary for your teachers. Um, I'm sorry, to yourself and then to your a teacher. Um, then you have payroll taxes. You have to have a telephone. You might advertise um, through a variety of websites. Um, then you need to actually keep your website running each month. You have food costs that might be subsidized by the USDA, might not gas for your vehicle because you're taking children to and from um, school um, because you have an after thing after school care you have a business credit card you have liability insurance which is absolutely necessary if you have your own business you have business supplies like what do you need for your classroom what do you need for events what do you need for your office um, like copy paper for um, to make sign out sheets ink for your printer in order to make those sign out sheets, a binder breaks, so you need to get a new one. These things happen every month. And so having a set amount that you're going to spend each month will help you be able to um, meet those costs. And then postage, if she's sending things away. So your total expenses are $5,000. So you're only making $900 in profit. Um, so that, I would say that that is actually quite good for a small, um, like family childcare or a small one to two room preschool. Um, having any kind of profit on some months is going to be seen as a win. I wanna sh have everybody shoot for a profit. In a nonprofit, in a military system, in a Head Start or state funded, you might not be looking to sh make profit. That is not um, why anybody went into this business. This is not a money making, this is not a cash cow. This is not what you go into if money is your, is your bottom line. We went into this because we love education. But we do want to shoot to make a profit. So even if you are in a nonprofit or even if you're not handling money, 
being financially responsible with the money that you have been giving and then hoping to make a profit will make sure that that extra $900 can be recycled back into the program, either with salary, increased salaries and benefits, um, or for goals that you have for your program or for capital improvements that you need to do, like a new roof or new flooring. Um, so the first thing we're going to talk So what else? So there's typically, so I want to break seconds, down sorry. your staff. Uh, I need to go back a couple. And I will be doing this a lot today. I will be in and out of this because I'm going to be showing you guys a wide variety of um, things in other in Excel and other ways that you so can So there's budget. typically two types of expenses. So we have two types of expenses. We have um, fixed expenses and we have variable expenses. So our fixed expenses are our space and our rent and our mortgage, which is a huge cost typically. Then we have utilities that basically stay the same. Maybe in June and July, we have to run our air conditioning more, so it might go up 200 or $300, but typically we have utilities and they're in the same age range, in the same payment range. Then your insurance and liability, while the insurance people can um, increase it, it typically stays the same. Same with taxes. And then our mis miscellaneous fees, like our contingency fee, any audits that we have to receive, and then our salaries and benefits typically just stay the same unless we're increasing or decreasing our program. Then we have our variables. And our variables are things like equipment, um, maintenance, so like having to do the capital improvements that I keep talking about, like fixing a roof or flooring, um, and then new equipment, having to buy playground equipment that can be quite large, like a new slide or new swings or replacing mulch or putting rubber down. Those will be a variable expense. You won't be doing that every year or every month. Then supplies as well. We do know and we should plan that we're going to have to buy supplies, but we don't know what type they are. We can typically forecast, but sometimes things will change. Same with transportation as well, having to get places, maybe taking people on conferences, that might change. Marketing will change as well. You will make a part of this in your budget. So if you know that it costs $120 each year to maintain your website, because you have to pay for websites, then you know that $10 each month goes towards that cost. And then there's other variable fees like legal or professional fees. So if you have a lawyer um, that you contract with or a human resource consultants, you take people on field trips, if you have parent night out, that would be an increase in your income, or if you have um, family nights for families, that's typically a decrease in your income, you're spending that for those types of things. And then training for staff, I talked a couple weeks ago about trainings that we had where we had Lakeshore come out in order to minimize the cost for us. We um, joined up with four, I think it was three, three other sites, there are four total schools one of the schools was um, an after school program. They had access to a gym. We all met in the gym and we paid Lakeshore to come out and do a training with us. So that was a pain out that I had to do, but we got a little creative with it um, in order to kind of make it less expensive for everybody involved. We kind of pooled our resources. So there's typically two types of expenses. So okay, so then down there's your also, staff salary and um, benefit expenses because there, sorry. so in the last couple of slides, we were. Um, so what is our income and what is our revenue? So how do we get our money? And that is from tuition. So tuition is our largest source of money for sure that we are bringing in. So I'm going to be talking about this book called The Business of Child Care with Gail Jack. And I talked about it in my 150 as well. Um, but the key to value to, if the key to valuable property is location, location, location and child care, the key to financial viability. So the ability to keep your program running is enrollment, enrollment, enrollment. So uncollected tuition, decreased enrollment is going to be a concern. Um, but the best thing to do is not count on 100% enrollment every month. So how you're going to pay your staff and how you're going to keep your program running should not ever depend on having each classroom completely full at all times. That is not realistic with the families that we work with. They move, they are sick, they leave the program, they get older and they act, act, their maximum age is out of our program. So we are going to never want to say that we're going to have 100% enrollment and that because that's how we get our, in, our income, our revenue. That's, that's our stream. Even if it's through state eligibility, 
don't count on always having 16 infants and 44 toddlers and 120 preschoolers. I would decrease that by probably at least 15%. It's a couple spaces each one that you're not depending on. Um, and so that might change how you schedule your staff, how you have shifts um, for your staff and how you pay your staff is you need to make sure that you have more money coming in. So you have more income. So in the last couple of slides, um, an actual so many of you right now. So the. So um, sources of income and federal funding. Um, so I'm going to go back because I think, sorry. So here's state funding. Um, so a lot of us come from a state funded program or a federally funded program. So like a Head Start or um, a Department of Education or a California Department of Education school. Um, so there are lots of money from this and there's a lot of eligibility with this and I will talk about this. What I've kind of listed for you is all of the funding and grants that are possible um, for people. So if you are not currently receiving state funding, I would look into it. It's a great way to increase your enrollment and it's a great way to get a little bit more of a consistent income. Um, while also meeting a need in the community, lower income families um, need quality education. And if we can provide that, then I would encourage people that are not to look at state and federal funding. What I have for you though, is a bunch of resources um, that you can look into because we, there's a lot of, there's a billions of dollars out there in eligibility through state or so, through federal funding. Um, and this is um, for our federal funding. The federal programs, programs that most of them. Um, so let's say that you're a teacher. Thing, is um you can turn the class all right Jim, and you want to okay go back one more okay so i think the an interesting thing about um these eligible programs is that a lot of us are not using them so six out of seven children eligible for subsidized child care did not receive services from state programs in 2015. this is um, a survey of um California state preschool program. So at first I thought, oh, this must mean like Minnesota or Wisconsin or something like that, somewhere not near us. Because so many of our families are state, are um, subsidized or they were only running in a state funded program or something like that. Um, but there's actually a lot of, it's like over a million children who are not being served by this program that, that can be. Um, so if you are not using um, state subsidized children or that's not part of your enrollment package right now, definitely look into it. We're meeting a need in the community and that can help with you continuing to make fees as well. And those websites that I previously had either through the state um, government or through the federal government are resources for you in order to kind of start that journey if you wanted to. But if you want to learn more budget about budgets or you want to learn more about state subsidized programs or you're a teacher or a state supervisor and you just want to know more about how budgets work, that's a goal for yourself. You're either starting your own program or you would like to move up the ranks um, and knowing about financial programs is definitely going to help you become a program director or above. Um, I would ask to shadow or work with, they're typically called enrollment coordinators or they can just be accountants. Um, and say, you know, this is my professional goal. This is how I want to develop myself this year. Um, when, you know, we have a, a low afternoon or um, if we have a sub or if my center is doing fine um, and I can have a teacher um, fulfill my administrative roles or my assistant director, can I come and shadow you? Can I see what enrollment coordinators do or what accountants do so I can start to understand how the financial side of this program works? Um, you can also make it your professional goal to attend conferences or work with accounting or assist to your director. So if you're a teacher right now at nap time, um, either her coming into your classroom or you going out, working in the front office and looking at the enrollments and the subsidized programs that you have, what kind of income do you have? You know, if, if this was something as a director that I thought that I could get some support with and I had another set of eyes, I would probably really welcome it. Um, that would take some, that would allow me to delegate certain parts of it or um, have some support from other people. If your program is large enough, and some of our programs are large enough, we're within um, school districts or large state funded programs or nonprofits, or like 
after school programs like YMCA, Boys and Girls Club, you can take time to meet with others in your department at professional development days or um, just calling and emailing them and learning more about your actual or own organization. You can ask to go to board of directors meetings um, and just observe and to listen. And this will let people know, like, I am interested. I like where I work and I would like to rise to the ranks. Typically, we're going to want to hire within, within people that we know can do the program. So now we're going to kind of go to expenses. So previously I was talking about income. So we are going to do it by becoming state funded or federally funded, and we're going to do it by enrollment. So the money that families actually give us through tuition. What are our expenses? What's going out each month? We have money coming in. Hopefully it's enough to keep our program money. What, what do we have to spend out on? Rent and staff salaries, that's always going to be the biggest thing. If you're lucky enough to be within a church or you're having the location donated, fantastic, but rent can often be a lot of money. But by far the biggest thing in, in all industries and in all business, what you spend out is your staff salary, your benefits, and then promotions. That's 100% your biggest expenses. And for us, economically, we are not a cash cow. There is, we have ratios, so I can't stick 57 infants in a classroom that's only regulated um, or only staffed for four infants. You know, like I can't just keep adding and adding and adding infants in order to increase my enrollment exponentially. At a certain point, it's capped. You can only have a certain amount of enrollment in each classroom and then for a whole program. So it's a balancing act between keeping your employees, the people who actually provide this service, who are taking care of these children, who then need salaries, raises, and benefits, and then keeping enrollment low enough to be competitive so that parents are actually going to come to your center. If it's too much money in where you're located, it might not be able to do that. And then support your other financial goals of the program. So it's really a balancing act and it's probably one of the more difficult ones if you are a small business owner or you are a program director who is handling the financial management of a program. It's, it's a really difficult thing to do between I have salaries that I need to pay, I want to give raises, I want to have benefits, but I also have to have low enough enrollment so people actually come to my center and pay tuition. So how are we actually gonna pay staff salaries? And that's gonna be our assignment and I'm gonna work through that. That's why I'm kind of um, happy, I'm gonna be clicking in and out of this PowerPoint. Um, I'm gonna be showing you um, some ways that you can do that. But typically your staff salary is based on education and experience. So what they are coming to you with, and then if they get permits or if they get degrees with you, do they go up a step? So they, do they make more money if they achieve an educational goal? And then also needs to be competitive with the community. If you're paying much, much less, but you're expecting the same duties, is somebody going to want to work for you? Um, are they going to leave? Um, and then are you paying a lot more than anywhere else? And no wonder you're having a hard time covering. Another thing that impacts this is your minimum wage. It's the minimum amount that you can pay people. So um, we'll talk a little bit more about that, but I want to kind of tell you that forecast is that the minimum wage is going to reach $15 in 2022. So that's in four years. I know it sounds really crazy. It's 2018. In four years, staff, um, the minimum wage is going to reach $15, and they're forecasting that even for 2023 or 2024, 2025, even for small businesses. So even if you have less than 25 employees, the minimum wage in California is most likely headed towards um, and will be $15 across the board for all industries. So that is definitely going to affect our enrollment. In 2020, 21, 22, we're going to start seeing most likely um, increases in how much we charge for tuition in order to compensate um, for paying teachers more. So you have to balance what you can pay with what you pay your staff with what you can afford based on enrollment and childcare tuition while also paying a living wage because I am a big advocate. I have lived on minimum wage. When I started, I got seven nineteen an hour. Um, and I had to live with my parents. I couldn't afford to teach full time um, and have I, and live independently in 2000. It, it, was, it was impossible. It, it, and that was almost 20 years ago um, at minimum wage. So it's good that it's increasing because it hasn't in a really long time. But we also need to be realistic about how that's going to change our industry because pretending that it's not going to change our industry is going to hurt small programs. 
So what we're kind of looking at is a salary matrix or a schedule. So that's what I talked about before is your job performance, your time at the company, your education and permit achieved. Do you go up a step? And many of you are already in a step program as well already. And that's why you're wanting to get permits. The permit that you have allows you to make more an hour. So you have to start with $11 um, or 1050. So if you're having less than 25 people, you have to start at 1050 an hour, or you have to start at 26. Uh, if you have more than 26 employees and it's $11 an hour. So when we're looking at our staff budget, what are you spending on staff, what you need to know and what you need to know about your program. Even if you're a site supervisor, it's good to know what do you spend on salary? What do you spend on paid time off or time off or vacation or whatever your package is for people for taking time off? What do you spend by age group? Because obviously our infants are going to be a lot more money than our preschool. Preschools we can have 12 to 1 whereas in our infant rooms we're having with our enrollment is a lot lower um, and so that means that our infants are typically a lot more money so i'm going to share my screen right now and i'm going to come back to this but right now what i'm going to do is i'm going to open another screen and i'm going to show you Okay, so this is um, from just a online resource. Can you see that? There we go. Okay, so this is from Find My Shift. Um, and I just bring that up because there's a lot of template organizations out there. So you don't have to use Find My Shift. You can find anything on Pinterest or the web that will do staff schedules for you so that you can kind of see how much you're spending. Um, so you will list typically all of the employees that you have. So I'm saying, you know, there's Jane, there's Joe, there's Anna, there's Chris, there's Lily, what they make an hour and then what their pay is, what their shift is, all that type of so you can see Jane makes $15 an hour. She works five days a week. She's making 40 hours a week. Then you can like, so I kind of had it at Jane, Joe, Anna, and Chris, and Lily all were my infant classroom teachers. Um, so then I would add this as I went along and this would allow me to say, to see and a breakdown cost to how much each of my staff was making, how much I was spending on my infant room class. And this also allows you to schedule as well. Um, and then also really easily take your Excel spreadsheet and put it against an actual schedule with your enrollment. So if Lily doesn't need to work um, five days a week, maybe your enrollment is based on part-time as well and you only need two to three hour, uh, two to three days a week, two to three days a week or three hours a day or something like that. Maybe you can do that in order to kind of save costs. costs. So that's a good way um, for some people to do that. Okay, now I'm gonna go back to this. Okay, so, and I'm gonna be doing that a lot. I'm gonna be clicking in and out of Excel spreadsheets in order to kind of show you how you can do that in the moment. Um, so now we are back. So this is an example of a staff salary matrix that's done by education and experience. And this one is actually from Eagle Glen School, which is school district, which is up in California and they have a very transparent um, website. Um, so I actually took this because I wanted to see something that was in California um, that we could compare to maybe what we are paying. So if you are coming in as an aide, so you have zero to six units and you have less than a year of education at an Orange Glen, that is actually terrific. You're making $13.45 an hour. Um, that's a really good um, living wage for somebody who is an aide in, within our industry. But if you look at um, your 32 ECEs um, and then step five, so you've been there for quite a bit or you're coming in with a lot of experience, you're making almost $20 an hour. Um, so that's fantastic as well. Um, it does go more into um, 
types of things, but you might want to look at permits. So if you are a state funded program and you need your teachers to be permitted, you would get rid of the ECE units and you would do it by actual permit that they have because you can't hire them with just units. You need to hire them with some kind of permit. So that's why um, it's something that you can change yourself. So now I'm gonna click back out of this again, because um, what our assignment is, is I have made a matrix for you. So I've done a kind of a step already. Um, so depending on your experience in education, where you are, and then you guys are gonna work through a salary budget. For some of you, this is gonna seem really easy. You're doing this on a daily basis. So just have fun with it, see how what I've created. For some of you, you've never been in Excel before, you've never played with money, you have some math anxiety. So this is gonna be a little bit difficult. You're probably gonna to wanna to do it over a couple of days. And like I said, this is really just kind of playing with it. And I'll show you more about the actual assignment that I'm asking you to do on Excel. But take a deep breath. This is pretend money that you're playing with. This is to help you start to understand what management is, what fiscal management is. I'm not expecting you to be perfect or to have it understood. Or if you're spending $7 million each month on preschool money, you know, I'm probably going to gently guide you to, you know, why that might be incorrect. Um, but you're, you're just kind of looking at the money in an Excel spreadsheet because even the programs that you can buy, like Quicken and payroll things are kind of based off an Excel spreadsheet um, idea already. So if you are having more anxiety about it than you think that you should, the fantastic thing is that Palomar has a lot of support first with tutoring, so they would be able to show you how to use Excel. Um, and then in general, like a professional development, you need to take on a management role and that's gonna include money. Then we have math, business, and finance classes. I just met a finance professor at a, um, couple, last month um, and she's fantastic. And a lot of her class is just like loans and budgets and online banking and all that type of stuff. Like I, when I was talking to her, I was actually like, I, I probably need to take this class just for myself personally. So that I know what equity means and what my home mortgage means and how I, what's a 15 rate, 15 year rate, what's a 30 year rate, like kind of that stuff that I'm a little bit mystified in my own life. So I'm actually thinking about taking one of the finance um, classes here at Palmore in order to be better at my own personal life. Um, but we have these services for you. So if that is a goal for you, you know, you can step out of the child development section and go to business or go to math or go to finance and get some support. So, but right now I'm going to take you back out and I am going to go to your uh, uh, online assignment. So this is what you're going to see this, um, this, some, this week. All right, so when you open your assignment in Canvas, this is what you're going to see. So over here on the left-hand side is the wage matrix. This is what I've already created for you. So right there is the wage matrix. So I'm gonna give you an example. So you are coming in, you, are, you have zero experience or you have a year or six months in your field. If you are being hired as an aide, you're gonna make $11. If you have already have your ba your bachelor's degree or your AA, but this is you're new to actually teaching in the field, um, this is what you are expected to make. How I calculated this though is I took the starting minimum wage salary, so what anybody coming into a job um, should be paid, and then I did it by 10%. So um, from 11 to 12, 10 is is 10% increase. From 12 dollars to 13 dollars is 10%. 14 to 16, so down, 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 this is all um, increasing by a factor of 10%. Same with this, so every time you bump up in your experience, in your education, so once you get a permit or you get more credits, and I did it by credits and then um, uh, uh, AA, a BA, and then an MA, so if you had that kind of experience, you're jumping up by 10% as well, so from 11 to 12, 10, those numbers are the same on each side. So these numbers up here are, would be the same as down here. What I did change though, is that you will top out at making $16 if you stay an aide forever. For some people, they wanna be an aide, they love being an aide, they love playing with children, they don't want the responsibility, they can't handle the responsibility, or they have other things in their life, and they just wanna be an aide. 
a playground duty, whatever it is for the rest of their life. That's fantastic. I love people knowing who they are and having that self-awareness. But you're probably not going to be financially compensated for remaining there. And that's what I kind of changed is so after seven, eight, nine years of experience, if you're still remaining a um, aid in my organization, that's, that's what you're going to top out at. You're not going to top out at more. I can't continue in this field to kind of pay people who aren't going to get more um, education or experience. So that's kind of what changed it. But everywhere else, it's by a factor of 10%. So you can see... Um, I have a bachelor's degree. Uh, I'm sorry, I have a master's degree and I have 15 years of experience. So if I was entering into my own childcare program, I would be making $34 an hour. I don't know how realistic this is. Um, the most I've ever been given as a teacher was $21. Uh, and that was pretty extreme. That was a lot of money for a teacher to be making in our field. Um, so I'm not sure if you could be making $34.52. That would be fantastic. That's a great living wage. I would hope that we would all have that. So this is the wage matrix that I've kind of made for you guys. Um, so what you're going to do is you are going to come over um, to an, the example preschool. So anywhere you see red, that's what you're going to be filling out. So what I've already done is, this, like, I'm considering this as a pretend preschool classroom. So what you do is you hit... Um, the button and you can pick the years of experience. So you can say, okay, employee number one, little Jane Doe, she has seven years of experience and she has a degree. She has an AA in early childhood education and she works for me 20 hours a week. So then you're going to see, we're going to be paying her an annual salary of $20,000 a year. Then I've got my other employee. She's got been with me forever. She got nine years of experience and she has a bachelor's degree and I pay her $40 an hour. She works 40 hours a week. So her pay rate, and this is what's going to autofill for you. So I've set it up so that Excel brings in this information from this wage, wage matrix and it puts it into my preschool classroom. So she's going to be paid $25 an hour. I give her 40. She's got 40 hours a week that she works with me. So she makes $54,000. So that's just an example of, so then I have an aide in the classroom. Let's say those are my two full-time teachers or, you know, I'll make her full-time. Those are my full-time teachers, my lead teachers in a preschool classroom, and then I've got an aide. Um, and she only works 30. So that's where I might be saving money, um, is having an aide that comes in to do breaks and something like that. But I'm still paying maybe two classrooms. Um, with 12 kids each, I'm paying $112,000. The interesting thing that some of you might be noticing is this doesn't include payroll taxes, social security, benefits, pay time off, any of those types of things. This is just like pay rate and hours per week. So if at 112, I'm probably paying 150 um, with the healthcare, hopefully that I'm paying, um, but with also with paid time off because they have to have time off. It's a legal mandate now. Um, so that is cost that I have to incur within myself. I either have to pay for a sub or um, she has to be off, but I'm not, I'm, I'm paying her to be off, um, but she's not actually performing work for me. So that is a cost to my program. Um, so you're going to increase if, if you know, if you've been in this program, you're kind of if, when I, when I actually do this with my Excel, I have another chart right here that actually, um, in, puts in my paid time off, um, my benefits, my payroll taxes, social security, all the other things that I continue to pay. Um, so you would actually take this number and make it much larger. But for the intents of this assignment, for some of you that this is very new, all you're doing is you're playing around with this. So you're kind of taking a preschool classroom, or you could even consider it an infant classroom, wherever you work, just kind of play around with what is the experience that people have? How much does it actually cost? Um, so let's make it, let's make it a little bit less. Let's say we have a, um, we're a, we're a state funded program. So we have people that have um, permits of some kind. So $180,000 is how much I'm spending to have 
um, one, two, three, five full-time people working in my program that all have permits. I'm spending $180,000 just on salary. And then if I was to actually look at all the other things that I have to pay, it's over $200,000 that you're paying annually to keep one, two, maybe even three like preschool classrooms up and running. Um, so this is what you're doing this week. You are only, this is going to be blocked. If any of you like this um, and you know Excel, I can send you it and it will not be blocked or I can give you a password. Um, but for the actual assignment, what you're doing is you are playing with these areas. You're dropping down and you're moving things around in order to get a sense of how salaries are used and how matrices are made in order to pay your staff. Um, so the only way that you would get a bad grade on this is if these things are blank. So if you haven't done anything and you're just giving me what I've already given to you, then, then we're going to probably have um, some issues. Um, but what I just want you guys to do is understand Excel and understand how much money you actually have to pay um, for people's salaries. Okay. Back in here, just to say what you're going to be doing this week. Um, so this week in the discussion boards, we're going to be talking about budgeting and money issues. Um, chapter six in the textbook has some information about fiscal management. It's very broad, um, which I think it does a nice job of talking about all the diversity in your field and some issues that you might have to deal with. They also talk about grants, way to, ways to make money. Um, that are not just tuition. So I think it's a, a fairly good resource. Um, I also have um, from Gail Jack's The Business of Child Care. Um, it's a fantastic book. Um, I've got it right here. Um, it looks like this. I have used this a lot in the field. It has everything that you might need to do the basics of running a program. Um, I think it's quite cheap on Amazon. You don't have to get, if you were interested in this, this was something that you were interested in. It is on, on Amazon. Um, but she has enrollment and fee resources. So if increasing your enrollment and getting more fees in order to support your program is something that you need, I have that resource for you on Canvas. And then I also have a PDF. It's quite large, but it's about owning and operating your own business. I know for some of you, you're wanting to open your own FCCs or your own small child cares. Um, so this is a good resource about owning and operating your own business, being a small business owner. And then your online um, assignment is what I just took you. So you have your little wage matrix. It's blocked. I've increased all, I've made all of the experience and all of the um, education parts of the matrix. So the steps that you take depending on how much education or experience you have. Um, so all you're doing is you're just playing with the drop down parts of that red thing in order to get a sense of how much money it costs to maybe keep a couple of classrooms in a program running especially now that our minimum wage is starting to change. So I hope that this is a good resource for you, first for people that are beginning in their journey of fiscal management, and then others for you, of you that are small business owners or program directors or people that are already doing it, ways that you can start to understand how minimum wage changes are going to affect you and the classrooms that you have. So once again, thanks so much, guys. And if you have any questions or if you want me to send you the Excel spreadsheet not protected so that you can use it for yourself and your own programs, um, please just shoot me an email. Otherwise, I will see you in the budgeting section of our um, of, of Canvas. Have a great week. Bye.